Last year, Midland Power continued our mission of providing our members with the reliable and affordable power you depend on. So this morning we were at Dawson Substation. This is one of our three subs we rebuilt last year. We also included a new sub into our system last year. This sub was a complete rebuild from the ground up. Allowed us to expand the layout, give us more access to different parts of the sub for maintenance and repairs. And with every sub we rebuild, we're upgrading the transformer, the voltage regulators and the breakers, which improves reliability for our members. So with upgrading our subs to have a uh, higher capacity, we're increasing our ability to switch to other subs and pick up more load during storm situations so we can get people on faster. In addition to the Dawson substation, we also completed upgrading the Scranton substation and continued work on the Bagley and New Hastings substations. Last year we updated 30 miles of line total spanning over four different counties. Those areas are identified by age and condition of the current system and also what areas could we benefit from a higher capacity due to load growth and also helping with switching during outdoor situations. So every area is kind of different on how we choose how much of it gets rebuilt. A lot of it just comes back to the age and condition of the system. Sometimes it might be a mile, sometimes it might be three or four miles. So whatever comes in the future with increased demand for electricity, um, these substation upgrades, these line upgrades is how, are how we are preparing for that increased need down the road. Midland Power put in 240 new services last year, uh, primarily in housing developments in the Polk City and Ames area. Midland has upgraded uh, the substation in the large growth areas, um, especially in Squaw Valley. Uh, we've upgraded lines for the new load growth. As a cooperative, we see in the future uh, more load growth with EVs coming online. We are taking steps to increase the backbone of the main structure and housing developments, especially right now, um, just looking into the future. We've also continued to prioritize vegetation management. We're looking at a private right away that we did uh, tree clearing in 2022 on. We do uh, one fifth of our system every year, which comes out to about 850 miles of line per year is what we trim out. Our tree clearing program is pretty extensive. We go, uh, we try to get 20 foot of clearance on each side. We get all the overhang, we get all the undergrowth, we mow these private right-of-ways. Midland Power spends about $750,000 a year on tree trimming, and it does gr greatly improve the reliability of the system. As an electric cooperative, the safety of our members and employees is our top concern. We're going out to visit the crews today for a crew visit. These are a continuous task that we do uh, as part of our safety program. The safety goes for everybody, anywhere from accounting to engineering, uh, operations, member care. Uh, it's, it's across the board for the co-op, everybody in the co-op. So we're over 430,000 hours without a lost time accident, um, and we're still ticking away. In our world, you do business with people, whether it's our members out there, but also it's the people you come to work with every day. And caring about those people, both your membership and our people here, that's what safety is all about. Um, it's about making sure everybody goes home at night, just like they came to work that morning. Safety is top priority to go up uh, in my mind because the last thing we want to do is have to go make a call to somebody's house, um, you know, a fatality or an injury. If you don't know what you're doing and you're, it's your first day on the job, you can stop the job. Uh, we, we stop at nothing at safety, so it, I mean, to us it's a culture at Midland. So our line crews are what make this whole thing possible. They're putting in services, they're maintaining the current system, and they're the ones who get called out when power goes out. They're on standby 24-7. So being a lineman is uh, it's a lot of dedication. Uh, safety is number one priority. You have to be always ready to go. They work a lot of storms. They work in all different kinds of weather conditions. Um, you know, they're on call. It's, it's a demanding job. I think just a willingness to help and sacrifice for everybody else, you know, they're working in the harsh, harshest of conditions and it's not a job for everybody, but the special few who can do it, you know, they do a great job at it. 
as we work to safely ensure reliability. We are also focused on maintaining affordability into the future. So one of the exciting things about my job is I get a chance to vision and look at the future and see where changes are. And so we did put together a task force to study electric vehicles. One, how they're gonna impact our membership, uh, the benefits they might provide, but also then also how it affects the co-op. And is it gonna put extra demands on our infrastructure? How is it gonna impact um, the pricing and how we send the right pricing signals so that people can charge and operate their vehicles in the most cost-effective uh, and productive way without impacting their neighbors. Midland, we formed the EV Task Force to basically to help educate ourselves first on electric vehicles. Uh, that way we might be able to help and educate our members more. We're wanting to become the, the experts that our members can come to and ask us for advice and for knowledge uh, whenever they need to know uh, what this uh, vehicle might do to their electric bill or how they operate and how they can better use them. Our members are going to be talking to all aspects of our employees, not only the customer service people when they call in, but our linemen out on the lines quite often get uh, questions asked to them by our members. We want them to be able to answer those questions as well. Midland Co-op is, you know, they're forward thinking enough that they know that these these EV vehicles are coming. People are intrigued by them. They've got to know what kind of capacity these things take, how many is there out there, how many could be out there, and what's their demand for their substations to handle all this. Uh, electric vehicles have their place for the people that uh, want to use them, but then you also have our fossil fuels, our ethanol industry, and you're not going to be able to just all of a sudden flip a switch and go from all fuel transportation to all electric transportation. As far as transportation future, I believe it'll be in all aspects, whether it be fuel or electric. We, we support them all. You can't just rely strictly on one source of fuel for our transportation. You're going to have uh, fossil fuels and you're going to have electricity and it's going to take a mixture of both to make this work for us. Just as we support an all of the above approach to transportation, we also advocate maintaining a smart mix of generation resources to provide reliable and affordable baseload power. We engage regularly with our elected officials helping to educate them on the issues facing our industry. In March we joined electric co-ops from across the state at the REC Day on the Hill and in December, we held our annual legislative breakfast in conjunction with Consumers Energy to discuss the key legislative priorities for the upcoming session. And all of the above energy strategy or portfolio for generation uh, comes down to a few factors. One is reliability. We want to have a reliable system that we're not have to worry about uh, rolling blackouts and things like that. And so having a balanced portfolio for generation taking in all the, the generation assets we could have is very similar to you know having a 401k portfolio that's diversified again amongst different things. There's an old saying don't put all your eggs in one basket so to speak and that, and that speaks to that principle and so reliability and maintaining a reliable system is hugely important. It's a message the state's electric cooperatives shared at last year's Farm Progress show in Boone. We have uh... A lot of RECs, uh, big and small, anywhere from uh, a few hundred all the way up to about over 30,000 um, member consumers. Well, looking at power supply, we need all the available power supply we can get, all the above, which means we need, um, we need to use coal to generate electricity, natural gas. But at the same time, uh, there is room for renewables, whether that's wind or solar. Uh, battery technology has uh, come a ways, but it's got, got a long ways to go. Baseload generation is essential. I mean, even in Iowa here, you know, we have a lot of wind, we have a lot of solar, things like that, but there's many days where we don't have wind and it's cloudy. So you have to have baseload generation. So to do that, you know, we need green coal plants. We get to make sure that that's sustainable. We need to make sure we have natural gas. We have to look at nuclear power. I mean, these are, these are baseload generation uh, areas that, that we need to continue to embrace and we can do that and we can supplement it then with wind power, solar power and, and other things. But again, the bottom line is we have to have uh, electric, we have to have power every, each and every day and to do that we need baseload generation. 
to help provide future rate stability. Midland Wholesale Power Provider, Corn Belt Power Cooperative, is exploring utility scale battery storage technology. The primary goal for the project was to learn more about battery energy storage systems. Um, how to engineer a project, how to procure the equipment, how to construct a project. So that was the primary goal. Then of course once it's installed, how do you operate it? Um, what are the benefits? What, what can you do with a battery to provide a benefit for the membership? The 1.4 megawatt Tesla Megapack can store enough energy to power roughly 145 homes for six hours at a time. By reducing our peak demand charges every month, Corn Belt um, maintains a better margin, and so that margin then, theoretically, at the end of the year, gets passed on to the member co-ops, and then that saves them money at the end of the year that they can then pass along to their members. So final project cost was just over $3 million and based on what we can save each month, um, every month we're assuming we're going to get that benefit, it's going to take close to 11 years to pay back. So it's not a, it's not a big money maker by any means, it's, it's a lot of dollars in investment uh, and it's going to take a lot of time to pay back. As a rural electric cooperative, we're focused on helping existing businesses thrive and attracting new businesses to the counties we serve. We are just getting ready to open Chirp Coffee on, in Jefferson, Iowa, right on Highway 30. It started with some friends that went out to dinner. Um, it was back in February of 2022, and we were talking about another local group of women that did uh, a big project downtown. We were just talking and decided, uh, well, what could we do for our community to make it better? And we all wanted drive-through coffee, so kind of went with that and ideas started turning and we just ran with it. We learned about the revolving loan fund from um, our local GCDC group. Midland and Corn Belt were very helpful and they were really a, a critical piece of our financing puzzle. The co-ops were great to work with. We had several phone calls, lots of emails back and forth. They just made the whole process much easier. It, it seemed like a daunting thing um, at first when we started the application, but they kind of walked us through it and made it made it easy to do. We could have went um, with traditional bank financing, um, but interest rates were a, a lot higher for a business like us. Midland Power, we, we love partnering with local companies and, and being able to use and, and share the revolving loan fund with them. Uh, we can help enhance, help a, an expanding company or a new company like Chirp uh, get its feet off the ground or, or improve their operations. And, uh, ultimately, our goal is to enhance the communities, uh, in, enhance the quality of life for the individuals in those communities. To help keep members' energy bills affordable and reduce wholesale power and demand costs, our energy services team partners with local contractors to promote the latest in energy efficiency building practices and technologies. We are in a home that we're building in Buck Hill Estates subdivision. Uh, it's actually an Ames address, but Boone County. We're building a two-story uh, house um, with an unfinished basement. Um, and there's many houses being built. There's about uh, 75 currently homes out here. Uh, we're actually building in the fourth edition of Buck Hill Estates, and uh, there's about 25 lots out here with four uh, houses under construction. Over the years, yes, we've built, tried to build really good relationships with all the area builders in Ames, Polk City, or wherever our territory is. Um, and we feel that we've done a good job, you know, building those relationships to help our contractors and our builders um, utilize the programs that Midland offers, uh, which ultimately benefits our memberships in the long run. People come in looking for a new home. Uh, a lot of times they're looking for the layout that they want, kind of more of an open concept. The existing inventory out there may be 20, 20 to 30 years old, uh, but the other part of that is the energy efficiency piece. You know, a lot of these homes, uh, the homes that we're building now are, are uh, a lot uh, more efficient uh, with the use of the wall systems and the insulation we're using and then also the mechanical systems that go into it. So when we first meet with uh, potential clients we do talk about 
uh, the energy piece of things and, and the utilities. And, and uh, when we're working on, a, on the Midland line, uh, we talk about the rebates that are offered for their systems for a more energy efficient system. We talk about the utility, the electrical rate. Uh, and so when they do get that second meter, that reduced rate meter, um, that they're saving on their energy. And so it pays to uh, spend a little bit more upfront on a, on a more energy efficient system uh, to be able to get that return in the long run. These are systems that uh, you know have long longevity. They're out there to last um, and uh, they'll perform you know very well in cold weather. These are the types of things that ultimately we present to our builders and our members um, so that they can have you know a, a long-standing piece of equipment, a long-running piece of equipment that's going to give them years of comfort, convenience at, at, at an affordable price. In addition to our energy efficiency rebates, Midlands Community Solar Program offers members the chance to enjoy the benefits of solar without the need to install and maintain an array on their own property. Located at our Iowa Falls Service Center, participating members receive a credit on their bill each month for the energy generated by their portion of the array. We met with a, a bunch of, you know, different companies. Mm -hmm to figure out which way we wanted to go. When we sat down and met with solar vendors, it turned out to be quite a bit higher. And I was looking for other opportunities that were at a lower price point. Mm -hmm. So Caleb figured all that up, came out, he met with me and came up with the 27 panels. And I'm just ecstatic about the, our first month's savings. Serving our members means doing more than just providing reliable and affordable electricity. It also means giving back in the communities where we live, work, and play. Last year, each co-op employee spent a day volunteering during one of our annual service days. In Boone, employees trim trees along Canyon Drive at Ledges State Park. In Iowa Falls, crews set poles helping to build the electric infrastructure for the Iowa Firefighters Association's annual convention. And in Humboldt, employees helped with the construction of the city's new Wildcat Wonderland playground, roughly 30 years after the staff of Humboldt REC helped construct the original structure. We also took time last year to thank you, our member owners, hosting three member appreciation events across the service area. These events drew nearly a thousand members for a free evening of food, family, and fun. As a cooperative, we're committed to education, helping develop our area's next generation of leaders. Last year, the cooperative selected Roland Story High School's Lucas Webker to participate in the Electric Cooperative Youth Tour in Washington, D.C. We also awarded three $1,000 college scholarships to help deserving area students attend college. And in August, we celebrated as member Paul Lawler of Union successfully nominated Nicole Lowe, co-founder of the Eldora Community Garden, to receive a $2,000 Shine the Light grant from the Iowa Association of Electric Cooperatives. Today we are at the Eldora Community Garden. It's a two-thirds of an acre a uh, fenced-in donation garden slash leased plot growing garden for the community. Um, but the majority of our space here is dedicated to giving gardens where we grow produce for the Pine Lake Food Shelf and for all of our neighbors to come and harvest whenever they need food. I know that it's hard for people who struggle financially to pay for fruits and vegetables. So I just thought we live on some of the most fertile Iowa soil and why not use that to grow food for our neighbors. Last year, we donated over 9,000 pounds of produce to the community. When I hear those stories from people, it, it really makes you feel good, makes you feel, wow, I am accomplishing something. I'm not just out here sweating and uh, pulling weeds, but it's actually helping people and it, it it really is a good feeling. People ask me how many kids I have and sometimes I joke and say I have two kids in a garden because <laughs> it's kind of like my third kid. <laughs> um, 
having people that are dedicated and involved is a key to the success here and I definitely couldn't do this alone. Uh, it's been a true community effort. Working together also means finding innovative ways to overcome today's challenging economic conditions. So inflation has been a huge impact, I think, for everybody in our everyday lives, whether it's buying milk and eggs at the grocery store, but also impacted us here at the co-op, and it hit every aspect of the co-op, from the cost of a pole uh, to a transformer, uh, the cost of trucks, um, our, our utility trucks has gone up astronomically. Supply chain issues are one, one challenge, uh, increasing cost, inflation, and, and with management identifying that and bringing that to the board, and we can uh, work together to you know build build inventories, for instance, and we have those inventories and we're sure the supply chain can't provide that. So that's really helped Midland, I think. Um, and then we curb costs as much as we can to, to keep uh, rates affordable. So we've main, maintained a solid equity um, through the years and we've continued to return patronage capital. 2022, Midland returned a million dollars in patronage capital back to the members. Residential members continue to provide just over half of the co-op's revenue. While the cost of purchase power comprises our biggest expense, we continue to maintain a healthy margin of $6.8 million with a $2.2 million operating margin. As a result, we received a clean financial audit. The cool thing about electric co-ops is that we have a history of coming together. That's, that's what founded the co-ops. We came together to solve the, the challenge of not having electricity in rural America. And our world is changing, and it's changing faster than it ever has before. And so, yeah, we're going to face a lot of challenges, but the, the exciting thing about a co-op is that we're going to continue to work together to meet those challenges. We've got the the challenge of changing in economics, um, the way just business and farming and so many changes in our in our state. Um, but those things are changing the industry, how we generate electricity, how we deliver it, the portfolios that come up. So whether it's we used to be coal based and, and we're transitioning to more sustainable uh, generation um, assets like wind and solar. And throughout that, the way you meet those challenges, you just stay focused on your core uh, your core values and what you're, what you're really focused on with reliability and affordability. So everything we do is going to focus on and come out of those two things. How do we keep the co-op providing reliable power to our membership? And that means investing in our infrastructure and making upgrades where we need to to accommodate increased demand, whether it's coming from electric vehicles or uh, changing and in, in going to more electric heating versus using fossil fuel sources for those things. So that means investing into infrastructure so it's prepared for that increased demand. We're constantly focused on affordability as well, but still making those investments in the system. And I think that's also going to look at how we, we interact with our membership. So it could be possible changes to how we structure and price uh, the product. So we send the right pricing signal so that a member can, can use the electricity the way they need to, but also have a say by changing their patterns or, or adjusting the patterns to control the cost, to maybe mitigate the cost of electricity. So we're looking at ways to be able to work with the members proactively to help them control the cost and then also um, provide the revenue we can to, to maintain that reliable system. Membership relationships, I think, come from being in proximity to one another. And I think the, the fact that we are a local electric cooperative, we have a locally elected board of directors, so there are members, friends, neighbors, uh, uh, peers in the, in, the, in the community, and I think that drives the co-op. And the fact that we're local, you can stop by the office and talk to somebody. If you have a question, we're going to come out and, and talk to you and try to help you through that issue and work through that. And I think the, the, the biggest driver, I think, is our relationship um, from the board uh, being the membership, uh, the co-op. Uh, focused on the membership. We're not focused on Wall Street and stockholders and investors. We're focused on Main Street and the people that live and work in our community, uh, the people at the co-op that you know them. They, you see them at a, at a baseball game or a football game on Friday night. Uh, we're part of the community and I think that bond of just being rural Iowans is a huge difference maker for us as an electric co-op.